Chapter Three of The Early History of the Airplane by Orville and Wilbur Wright. Some Aeronautical Experiments by Wilbur Wright. The difficulties which obstruct the pathway to success in flying machine construction are of three general classes. One, those which relate to the construction of the sustaining wings. Two, those which relate to the generation and application of the power required to drive the machine through the air. Three, those relating to the balancing and steering of the machine after it is actually in flight. Of these difficulties, two are already to a certain extent solved. Men already know how to construct wings or aeroplanes which, when driven through air at sufficient speed, will not only sustain the weight of the wings themselves, but also that of the engine, and of the engineer as well. Men also know how to build engines and screws of sufficient lightness and power to drive these planes at sustaining speed. As long ago as 1893, a machine weighing 8,000 pounds demonstrated its power both to lift itself from the ground and to maintain a speed of from 30 to 40 miles per hour, but it came to grief in an accidental free flight, owing to the inability of the operators to balance and steer it properly. This inability to balance and steer still confronts students of the flying problem, although nearly ten years have passed. When this one feature has been worked out, the age of flying machines will have arrived, for all other difficulties are of minor importance. The person who merely watches the flight of a bird gathers the impression that the bird has nothing to think of but the flapping of its wings. As a matter of fact, this is a very small part of its mental labor. Even to mention all the things the bird must constantly keep in mind in order to fly securely through the air would take a very considerable treatise. If I take a piece of paper and after placing it parallel with the ground, quickly let it fall, it will not settle steadily down as a staid, sensible piece of paper ought to, but it insists on contravening every recognized rule of decorum, turning over and darting hither and thither in the most erratic manner, much after the style of an untrained horse. Yet this is the style of steed that man must learn to manage before flying can become an everyday sport. The bird has learned this art of equilibrium, and learned it so thoroughly that its skill is not apparent to our sight. We only learn to appreciate it when we try to imitate it. Now, there are two ways of learning how to ride a fractious horse. One is to get on him and learn by actual practice how each motion and trick may be best met. The other is to sit on a fence and watch the beast a while and then retire to the house and at leisure figure out the best way of overcoming its jumps and kicks. The latter system is the safest, but the former, on the whole, turns out the larger proportion of good riders. It is very much the same in learning to ride a flying machine. If you are looking for perfect safety, you will do well to sit on a fence and watch the birds, but if you really wish to learn, you must mount a machine and become acquainted with its tricks by actual trial. My own active interest in aeronautical problems dates back to the death of Lilienthal in 1896. The brief notice of his death, which appeared in the telegraphic news at that time, aroused a passive interest which had existed from my childhood and led me to take down from the shelves of our home library a book on animal mechanism by Professor Mary, which I had already read several times. From this I was led to read more modern works, and as my brother soon became equally interested with myself, we soon passed from the reading to the thinking, and finally to the working stage. It seemed to us that the main reason why the problem had remained so long unsolved was that no one had been able to obtain any adequate practice. We figured that Lilienthal in five years of time had spent only about five hours in actual gliding through the air. The wonder was not that he had done so little, but that he had accomplished so much. It would not be considered at all safe for a bicycle rider to attempt to ride through a crowded city street after only five hours' practice, spread out in bits of ten seconds each over a period of five years, 
yet lilienthal with this brief practice was remarkably successful in meeting the fluctuations and eddies of wind gusts we thought that if some method could be found by which it would be possible to practice by the hour instead of by the second there would be hope of advancing the solution of a very difficult problem it seemed feasible to do this by building a machine which would be sustained at a speed of eighteen miles per hour and then finding a locality where winds of this velocity were common with these conditions a rope attached to the machine to keep it from floating backward would answer very nearly the same purpose as a propeller driven by a motor and it would be possible to practice by the hour and without any serious danger as it would not be necessary to rise far from the ground and the machine would not have any forward motion at all we found according to the accepted tables of air pressures on curved surfaces that a machine spreading two hundred square feet of wing surface would be sufficient for our purpose and that places could easily be found along the atlantic coast where winds of sixteen to twenty-five miles were not at all uncommon when the winds were low it was our plan to glide from the tops of sand hills and when they were sufficiently strong to use a rope for our motor and fly over one spot our next work was to draw up the plan for a suitable machine after much study we finally concluded that tails were a source of trouble rather than of assistance and therefore we decided to dispense with them altogether it seemed reasonable that if the body of the operator could be placed in a horizontal position instead of the upright as in the machines of lilienthal pilcher and chanute the wind resistance could be very materially reduced since only one square foot instead of five would be exposed as a full half horsepower could be saved by this change we arranged to try at least the horizontal position then the method of control used by lilienthal which consisted in shifting the body did not seem quite as quick or effective as the case required so after long study we contrived a system consisting of two large surfaces on the chanute double deck plan and a smaller surface placed a short distance in front of the main surfaces in such a position that the action of the wind upon it would counterbalance the effect of the travel of the center of pressure on the main surfaces thus changes in the direction and velocity of the wind would have little disturbing effect and the operator would be required to attend only to the steering of the machine which was to be effected by curving the forward surface up or down the lateral equilibrium and the steering to right or left was to be attained by a peculiar torsion of the main surfaces which was equivalent to presenting one end of the wings at a greater angle than the other in the main frame a few changes were also made in the details of construction and trussing employed by mr chanute the most important of these were one the moving of the forward main cross piece of the frame to the extreme front edge two the encasing in the cloth of all cross pieces and ribs of the surfaces three a rearrangement of the wires used in trussing the two surfaces together which rendered it possible to lighten all the wires by simply shortening two of them with these plans we proceeded in the summer of nineteen hundred to kitty hawk north carolina a little settlement located on the strip of land that separates albemarle sound from the atlantic ocean owing to the impossibility of obtaining suitable material for a two hundred square foot machine we were compelled to make it only one hundred sixty five square feet in area which according to the lilienthal tables would be supported at an angle of three degrees in a wind of about twenty one miles per hour on the very day that the machine was completed the wind blew from twenty five to thirty miles per hour and we took it out for a trial as a kite we found that while it was supported with a man on it in a wind of about twenty five miles its angle was much nearer twenty degrees than three degrees even in gusts of thirty miles the angle of incidence did not get as low as three degrees although the wind at this speed has more than twice the lifting power of a twenty-one mile wind 
as winds of thirty miles per hour are not plentiful on clear days it was at once evident that our plan of practicing by the hour day after day would have to be postponed our system of twisting the surfaces to regulate the lateral balance was tried and found to be much more effective than shifting the operator's body on subsequent days when the wind was too light to support the machine with a man on it we tested it as a kite working the rudders by cords reaching to the ground the results were very satisfactory yet we were well aware that this method of testing is never wholly convincing until the results are confirmed by actual gliding experience we then turned our attention to making a series of actual measurements of the lift and drift of the machine under various loads so far as we were aware this had never previously been done with any full-size machine the results obtained were most astonishing for it appeared that the total horizontal pull of the machine while sustaining a weight of fifty two pounds was only eight and a half pounds which was less than had previously been estimated for head resistance of the framing alone making allowance for the weight carried it appeared that the head resistance of the framing was but little more than fifty per cent of the amount which mr chanute had estimated as the head resistance of the framing of his machine on the other hand it appeared sadly deficient in lifting power as compared with the calculated lift of curved surfaces of its size this deficiency we supposed might be due to one or more of the following causes one that the depth of the curvature of our surfaces was insufficient being only about one in twenty two instead of one in twelve two that the cloth used in our wings was not sufficiently airtight three that the lilienthal tables might themselves be somewhat in error we decided to arrange our machine the following year so that the depth of the curvature of its surfaces could be varied at will and its covering airproofed. Our attention was next turned to gliding, but no hill suitable for the purpose could be found near our camp at Kitty Hawk. This compelled us to take the machine to a point four miles south, where the Kill Devil Sand Hill rises from the flat sand to a height of more than one hundred feet. Its main slope is toward the northeast and has an inclination of ten degrees. On the day of our arrival, the wind blew about 25 miles an hour, and as we had had no experience at all in gliding, we deemed it unsafe to attempt to leave the ground. But on the day following, the wind having subsided to 14 miles per hour, we made about a dozen glides. It had been the original intention that the operator should run with the machine to obtain initial velocity, and assume the horizontal position only after the machine was in free flight. When it came time to land, he was to resume the upright position and alight on his feet, after the style of previous gliding experiments. But in actual trial, we found it much better to employ the help of two assistants in starting, which the peculiar form of our machine enabled us readily to do, and in landing, we found that it was entirely practicable to land while still reclining in a horizontal position upon the machine although the landings were made while moving at speeds of more than twenty miles an hour neither machine nor operator suffered any injury 